Hi guys, welcome back to the Knitting Expat podcast channel. My name is Mina. I am back after a few weeks off, I guess. Um, I think the last video I posted was our garden renovation video. So that was posted about a week before little one showed up. So yeah, obviously we've had our baby. And uh, yes, I'm here today to kind of round out the pregnancy vlogs as it were. I know I ended the third trimester vlog a couple of weeks early. Um, so just wanted to give you guys a bit of an update on what was going on in these last couple of weeks before our little one <laughs> decided to come. I say she decided to come, but it's a bit of a story. We'll get there. Um, and what's been going on since she got here and a little brief rundown of her birth story, I guess. I'm not gonna go into too much graphic detail, but I'll um, give you the highlights as it were. Um, and yeah, and I also have another video idea related to pregnancy slash birth that I wanted to um see what you guys thought about so stay tuned to the end to hear what that idea is and let me know what you think in the comments down below so if you are new to this channel thank you so much for checking me out this is not my i mean i want to say this is not my usual content but this has kind of been the content recently um but typically this is a podcast channel and i do post and host a knitting podcast i just haven't done one in a very long time because this pregnancy was very hard and I wasn't doing a whole lot of knitting but hopefully I'll be getting back to doing more knitting podcasts and more knitting related content um, in not too long from now hopefully <laughs> very soon I hope um, but yeah so for the last couple of weeks before um, our little girl Nova is her name Nova was born um, I can't remember where I actually stopped the last vlog. I think I did mention that I'd gone in for my 36 week growth scan and um, I had been uh, diagnosed with having fetal growth restriction or IUGR is also what it's called, interuterine growth restriction. So Nova was measuring very small on the ultrasound and she was measuring small-ish but still within the normal range earlier um but this time she had sort of dipped just below or just around the mark the th sort of threshold they have for um classifying it as a growth restriction and so then i went and saw the consultant after that who then said basically um I'll, i will have follow-up scans a week after and then the week after that and based on the scan at the next week so around 37 weeks if uh, things were looking good, then all good. If it wasn't looking good, then I'd be referred for a um, induction at 37 weeks. Otherwise, if things look good, then they'd let me go to 38 weeks. I'd have another scan at 38 weeks, and then at that point, I would be induced because um, that's kind of just their protocol over here. They try and get you to 38 weeks. And if you have a growth restricted baby who's measuring small, they will induce you to get her out or get them out. Um, so that it doesn't have any sort of long-term impacts on their development um and there was no real reason for the growth restriction there just wasn't a there was nothing wrong with me i didn't have any of the risk factors there didn't appear to be anything wrong with her um again she didn't seem to have any of the risk factors and they couldn't tell if there was anything wrong with the placenta because that would be the other option where the placenta towards the end of the pregnancy just isn't functioning correctly and so it's um not transferring the nutrition or whatever correctly or enough to the baby causing the growth restriction so um we had lots of hospital visits lots of hospital checks in those last couple of weeks and because i was so paranoid every time i thought that oh she's not moving as much as usual i'd go to the hospital to get checked out so there were several trips to the hospital for um just just checking on her movements and making sure she's still okay in there but yeah anyway so bang on 38 weeks i was scheduled to go in for an induction at the hospital my mum was here to help us out not only with the new baby but also with layla to make sure there was always going to be someone here with her um she was still in school at the time so you know doing school runs and keeping up with her schedule so uh so that was great that was a real peace of mind my mum got back literally at the beginning of june 
and um because we weren't sure if she was going to come at 37 or 38 weeks she pretty much after a couple of days at home immediately came over and stayed with us from like the 5th of june onwards and uh, she's just gone home yesterday <laughs> so she's been and today is the 22nd of july so she just went home on the 20th of july actually so yeah she's been here this whole time like a month and a half she's been with us and um it's been an absolute godsend to have her here to be quite honest it's been so helpful and um and so yeah, it was it was a great peace of mind for both perry and i that my mum was going to be here with layla that we weren't going to have to worry about who was going to be able to come over in an emergency to watch her or to take her somewhere or anything like that anyway so that morning that we were being that i was being induced we were headed off to the hospital it was sort of the first proper heat wave we were having in the uk i don't know if it was ever actually classified as a heat, heat wave but it was the first like set of days where the temperatures were approaching around 30 degrees or just over 30 degrees centigrade and so it was hot it was miserable and if you don't know in the uk we do not have air conditioning even our hospital doesn't have air conditioning at least not the wards that i was going to be on so having spoken to a couple of uh, parents at Layla's school who'd also had summer babies at the same hospital that I was going to, um, they all said about how hot the hospital gets when in the labour ward and stuff. And I was like, okay. So Perry and I made sure we packed our we packed a fan. We had a large upright fan, like a tower fan. It's actually pretty good. And we took that to the hospital with us, which was hands down the best thing. <laughs> I took the hospital with me. <laughs> Um, this time around anything else I probably could have done without half the stuff I took with me but that fan I would not have survived without that fan um, every time the midwife um, a midwife or a new midwife came into our room they were always like oh your room is so much cooler than everywhere else I'm like yes we bought a fan <laughs> because I do not want to die in this heat I don't want to just melt away um, and the problem is when I'm pregnant, my hormones, like, I just overheat all the time. And even now, postpartum, I'm still constantly overheating, which, with this current heat wave, not very nice. Um, is she asleep? Oh, she's just nodded off. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> yeah. She just had her lunch before we came up, so, um, she is probably due a bit of a nap at this point. Hey, oh, you're trying to prove me wrong now, opening your eyes. Hey. Okay. Anyway, it's so like I said, we got into hospital and oh, we were there for a couple of hours before anything really happened. Like they showed us to our room and hooked me up to the monitor to like check on the baby, make sure everything's looking good before they proceed. And then they started the induction process around 2.30 in the afternoon. So so yeah so what happens at two at two thirty? what they do in the uk anyway is they give you something called a pessary which is something they put inside you to kind of try and uh stimulate the cervix to soften and to instigate labor um it's not hormonal but it is a chemical thing that they do and um they put that in and they leave it in for about 24 hours to see if that triggers labor on, on its own um after 24 hours they came back i mean i had regular monitoring throughout this period and when it became evident that nothing was going to happen that night i sent perry home so he got to come home um saw layla quickly and got to sleep in our bed because i got a bed at the hospital there was no bed for partners at the hospital so instead of him being sat in a really uncomfortable chair he came home and then came back the next morning and still nothing had really happened and then it got to about 2 30 in the afternoon again and so it had been 24 hours they came they took out the pessary and were like okay we're going to give it up to six hours now to see if things continue to progress on their own before we have to do anything else i'm like okay at this point i'm still on the anti-labor ward um i yeah i'm still on the anti-labor ward at this point anyway after a couple of hours it was becoming quick quite evident that the contractions were lessening they were becoming further apart and they weren't as painful anymore so i called the midwife back saying look that everything's wearing off so it's not progressed at all and by this time it was closer to around like five six ish in the evening and so they put something else in they put in something called a gel which is basically the same stuff as the pessary just more concentrated 
and um, that really ramped things up quite quickly after that like in terms of pain and contractions started happening quite quickly by the time they came and did that like I said it was about six o'clock um, so you know we didn't think anything was going to happen for a while because they, they put that in and they weren't going to check me again for another six hours after they put that in so um, they so I sent Perry home I was like you might as well go home and get some rest I'll call you they're gonna come check me in six hours at that point so it would have been like around one o'clock in the morning I was like just leave your phone on loud I'll call you if you need to come in otherwise I'll text you and you don't have to worry about it kind of thing anyway so he went um by the time he sort of got his stuff together and just and got going it was a bit later than that and then um a couple of hours later like I said the contractions and the pain everything was getting quite intense um and so I called the midwife in to come and check me to see if she could come and check me and I was only like two two and a half centimeters dilated at that point but I was in a lot of pain and so because I wasn't in active labor they classify active labor as once you get to four centimeters dilated and um, they were like you can't be moved to the delivery suite and you can't get an epidural until you're in the delivery suite so and I was sitting there going I really want this epidural now bear in mind up until the day we went into hospital my my plan of action my birth plan as it were if I even could call it that don't really I never had a proper birth plan with either of my pregnancies so um my birth plan was always just get the baby out of me in whatever safe way possible um but up until the day I was we went into the hospital I was kind of like oh if I you know if I feel like I need the epidural I'll get the epidural otherwise whatever we'll see how, how it goes kind of thing and but by the time we were going to hospital that day I was thinking to myself you know what I've been through a lot of pain with this pregnancy already I've been through so much I've been so uncomfortable and so much pain so debilitating especially towards the end I was like I don't want to martyr myself over this there is no medal for giving birth without pain relief there's no medal for giving birth without an epidural so I was like you know what I want the bloody epidural I want the epidural and that is what I want <laughs> Bear in mind with Layla in the US, I got the epidural when I was two centimeters dilated and I was also induced with her, so I was on the Pitocin and everything with that. She's a very noisy baby when she sleeps, there's lots of grunting and squeaking. Um, sorry, now there are flies, I've had the windows open because it's quite warm up here. Um, what was I saying? Got lost in. Anyway, yes, yeah, so I decided I was going to have the epidural not realizing that I wouldn't be able to get the epidural until I was in active labor and on the delivery suite. So what they'd originally said to me was, we will keep you in the anti-labor ward until you um, your cervix, cervix is dilated enough that we can break your waters because then that would put you into active labor or at that point when your waters break, you have to be taken to the delivery. So I was asking and they were like, yeah, we can break your waters, but there's just no space in the delivery suite for you right now. We kind of have to wait until there's like a midwife available to take you, etc., and all that. Because they have to maintain a certain level of space in the delivery suite for people who spontaneously go into active labor and have to go there immediately rather than me moving up and taking up a spot as it were which I understand but in the moment <laughs> when you're in that much pain and you just want some pain relief that is not what you want to hear so I was like okay um and because I was only like I said because I was only two and a half centimeters when they put in the uh gel I we didn't really think anything was going to happen that night anyway um it says things pro progressed for a couple of hours I asked them to come check me again because I felt like things were getting worse and I was still only two and a half centimeters but this time the midwife suggested that things might happen sometime that night and that it would probably be a good idea to call Perry to come back bear in mind at this point it was only like 9 nine thirty, so it wasn't that late into the evening and poor Perry had probably only just gotten home a little bit before then he, he hadn't really been home for that long uh, when I called him to come back I told him he didn't have to rush back but to basically come back whenever he can kind of thing um so yeah he got back by about 10 10 30 i think it was and um he basically just packed up our room because if we were going to be moving to the delivery suite i wanted us to be ready to go at a moment's notice without having to then wait and dawdle and pack up and stuff and i was in a lot of pain 
I was in a lot of pain and I was just trying to breathe through it and just breathe through all the contractions. They basically felt like they were, they were almost back to back at this point. They were only at best a minute apart. They were so close together. And I, between then and about 2.30 in the morning, I was calling the midwife back maybe every every hour, every couple of hours, to ch and I was still only at like two and a half centimeters over the span of like four hours until we got to 2.30 and I was just, I was in tears because I was in so much pain and nothing was happening and they weren't and I couldn't get any other pain relief other than like a cocodamol which is paracetamol and codeine um so yeah I was just <laughs> just so not happy in that moment and then at some point around 2 30 I guess I something changed and I don't really have very clear memories of this but something changed and I was essentially just screaming screaming bloody murder I, perry was just like i've never heard you scream like that like that was horrendous to hear that and i was just screaming and there was nothing no amount of breathing was going to help with that pain no amount of like controlled breathing was going to help and before we'd even had a chance to like call for a midwife or anything the midwife came running in immediately checked me she was like okay you're like almost at four centimeters we're moving to delivery now and I was like now okay and then they had the audacity to ask me if I could get up and walk I was like I'm sorry I can barely keep my eyes open I can barely breathe at the moment let alone walk so they they rolled me into the delivery suite on the bed and um Perry uh, came followed behind with all of our stuff and um and yeah and we got into the delivery room the lights were really dimmed and like to be honest i don't remember a huge amount i just remember someone handing me the gas and air and i was just there sucking on this pipe trying to like get it to do some kind of give me some kind of pain relief and i will be honest gas and air does absolutely nothing other than make you go a bit woozy and i think more than anything else it just gives you something else to focus on at least that's what it was for me and sometimes I wasn't even breathing in the gas and air I was just like biting down on the pipe just to have something to bite on um and just there was just so much screaming so much screaming and both the midwives and Perry were trying to like get me to like try not to scream so much but I was like I'm sorry I just can't help it there is nothing you could do right now to make me stop screaming um they were obviously concerned that I was gonna like exhaust myself from screaming to then not be able to push anyway there's me being rolled into delivery begging for this epidural and I even turned to Perry at one point I remember looking at him and saying promise me you'll get me the epidural and he's like looking at me like how am I going to promise that how can I promise that he didn't say that to me at the time thankfully but that was what he was thinking um anyway we get into <laughs> the delivery room and the, there was so it was just me perry the midwife and then a student midwife who was assisting they were running around they obviously were not prepared for me coming because they were still running around getting everything ready and i later found out that both the midwife and student midwife had just come off their break early to be able to like see me otherwise they were on their break they weren't supposed to be there um and so they were like running around and I was like, I really want the epidural. And they were like, I don't think there's going to be time. <laughs> and I was like, I really want. And they were like, okay, well, let's wait, and wait for this contraction to finish. And we'll, we'll assess and see where you're at and see if we can do the epidural. And they knew full well there was no epidural going to be happening. And then there's me screaming, I think I need to push. And so they were like, yeah, no, there's no epidural. Like, I'm still screaming for this epidural, even though the baby's crowning. And it was, yeah. So there was no epidural. Nova came out super fast. So from 2.30 when they checked me and I was almost at four centimeters dilated, my waters broke um, at three minutes past seven. Sorry, three minutes past three. And then at nine minutes past three, she was born. So less than 40 minutes from going into active labor to baby. So it was very fast. Um, and a little bit traumatic I won't lie not in a bad way but in the moment it felt very traumatizing because I'd gone in obviously that morning up until that day not having a plan other than her coming out and being open to delivering in whatever way possible to then deciding I was definitely going to have an epidural and then not having the epidural so that was um that was interesting in hindsight looking back 
like it's fine i'm okay with it i'm not like i don't have any ptsd from the birth or anything like that but in the moment it was pretty intense i remember at one point screaming that i wanted to die which i didn't really but it was one of those things you say in the moment because you're in so much pain and um and yeah but she came out nice and healthy all good just measuring quite small um she, she was definitely smaller than they even estimated she was going to be based on the based on the scans so it was definitely the right move to get her out she was um what did she weigh she weighed 2.8 kilos so that was about six pounds two and a half ounces so thankfully not too small that she had to go to the NICU she was um I can't remember I think they said that their sort of weight threshold was about two and a half kilos um, if so if the baby was born less than two and a half kilos they would as a matter of course be taken to NICU to be checked out but um, she was over that and so everything else looked fine they checked her out obviously in the delivery room and um, everything was good so they didn't need to take her to NICU thankfully so she stayed with us and I got to we got to have our golden hour bonding time in the delivery room the midwives kind of left us they went and brought us some toast and juice and stuff to for me to eat and um we did some skin to skin and tried some breastfeeding which seemed to go well and yeah like an hour later i think or however long later a couple of hours later i'd handed her to perry and I got up and I was bouncing around. I went and had a shower, everything. And I was just, it, only, it was only after I'd had the shower that it came out and I realized I'm not in pain anymore and this is so great. <laughs> um, and yeah, and so there didn't actually appear to be any reason for the growth restriction. The placenta looked fine and healthy. And like I said, neither I nor Nova had any um, health risks for that either. So it was just one of those things. And uh, and yes, and then after that we were taken up to the postnatal ward a couple of hours later. And and yeah, and whilst we were still in the delivery room, I think it was about six in the morning by this point, we were there for a few hours. Like we were, I was showered, ready, everything was packed up and I was like, look, I'm ready to go to the postnatal ward whenever you're ready because I, I know you guys need these rooms for the next people coming in. After what I'd been through waiting for a room and all that, I was like, I don't want anyone else to have to wait around <laughs> because I'm taking up a, a room. Um, but there was no one on the postnatal ward ready to come take us sort of thing, so we had to wait. So whilst we were there, we decided to call um, and speak to Layla and tell her the good news. Unfortunately, I didn't have, I wasn't quite with it enough to remember to pull out my camera to kind of film that moment, but it was a nice, it was a really lovely moment. She was so excited to see her and, um, and yeah, obsessed from the very first moment she saw her. And obviously my mum was very excited as well and all of that. And we went up to the postnatal ward, um, everything was fine there and like basically the rest of the hospital stay was fairly normal there wasn't any real issues in that regard um the only thing is here in the uk since covid they've obviously they've re relaxed a lot of the restrictions in the hospitals and stuff but they're still not allowing um visitors to the maternity ward or to the postnatal ward after you've had a baby so it's only your partner or technically only your birth partner can stay with you on the postnatal ward so no children no other family can come and see you in the hospital so that was a little bit sad that Layla couldn't come in and see her but we knew we were going to be going home fairly soon after so it wasn't like she was going to have to wait forever um and yeah and then we eventually got discharged the next day and we were home so she was born on Saturday and we ended up going home Sunday afternoon like early evening and and yeah and I do have a bit of footage from when uh, Layla first met Nova when we first got home and I will insert some of that for you guys here. It's just like what is going on? There's another one. Thank you. Thank you, Daddy. Hi. Hi. 
You have a little sister. Yeah. She's very little, isn't she? She's like a little dolly. <laughs> such a little radiator and I am sweating so much because she's on me however she's also such a clingy baby she does not like being put down at all at all like if I try and put her down when she's sleeping she might stay asleep for about 10-15 minutes and then she starts screaming and crying and you have to pick her up again so she'll fall back asleep otherwise she'll wake up so there's that that's fun it's really hard to do anything to be quite honest and now that my mum's gone and Perry's back to working like full on and he's actually funnily enough he's been really not that busy at work for the last three months or so and then just this week just as my mum went back home and uh, she actually took Layla with her so Layla's at my parents until the end of the weekend um, so it's just me Perry and Nova at home at the moment so typically just as she's left his work has picked up and so he's really busy and so I'm essentially even though he's working from home I'm essentially doing everything myself with Nova which is fine and it would be fine if I could put her down when she was sleeping so I could actually get some food or wash something or do something or just have a nap but um, she won't let me put her down. So even when she's sleeping, I can't go have a nap. Unless Perry can take her. And thankfully he has been able to take her for like an hour here, an hour there during the day. Usually when she's sleeping, he can hold her so I can do something else. But it is quite hard now that my mum's not here to basically bring me sandwiches and food and drinks whenever I need them to actually make sure I get enough food <laughs> because she won't let me put her down and it's really hard to actually do anything when you're having to hold a baby all the time. And before anyone says you should try baby wearing, I have. She's a radiator. I'm currently a radiator and we're going through a bit of a heat wave here in the UK. I cannot think of anything worse than strapping a mini radiator to my chest right now than that and I did actually try wrapping her a bit this morning today's a much cooler day still pretty hot but much cooler and she lasted all of about 15 minutes before she started screaming bloody murder because she was overheating and as soon as I took her out she calmed down and immediately fell asleep again so so yeah the wrap doesn't work right now whilst it's so hot because we're both running hot and so it's not the best thing for us right now I'm not used to this. Nova was Nova. Layla wasn't quite so clingy as a baby, so she was a lot easier to put down once she fell asleep. With her, the hardest, the harder part was getting her to sleep. But once she was asleep, we could put her down. Nova falls asleep quite easily when we're holding her, but putting her down is the hard part. So anyway, um, in other news, I've definitely had a much, and I don't think I really spoke about this much with Layla because that I had a lot of. Um, emotions around it shall we say and um, I in the end was never really able to breastfeed Layla I had so much trouble with that my milk supply never came in um, and by the time we got her tongue tie sorted she had a tongue tie as well by the time we got that sorted she'd already gone off breastfeeding she was frustrated and rejecting it and everything and we'd been supplementing with formula before we even left the hospital with Layla because she'd lost too much weight and all of that so that was that was a lot um and it's fine she's obviously healthy she was a healthy baby everything was fine in the end but the trauma of all of that um triggered 
uh, postnatal depression for me that had never been resolved at the time. No one ever really picked up on it. It never got dealt with and it then sort of transferred into like a full blown depression down the road. And a couple of, when Layla, was, around the time Layla was two was when I finally got treated for it. And it's been a lot better since, thankfully. And because of that history, obviously my midwives and everyone was aware of that. So there was definitely more attention paid to that sort of stuff this time around. Um, with Nova, however, I felt like breastfeeding was going fine initially. Um, everyone who came and checked was like, yeah, she's latching well, things seem to be going well, you know, you're doing everything right and getting lots of tips. I spoke to lactation consultants at the hospital, breastfeeding volunteer people, midwives, doctors, everyone I could speak to, I spoke to about it. And she seemed to be doing fine. But on our day five midwife appointment check, they weighed her and she'd lost like 13 and a half percent of her body weight which was a lot and um they say anything over 10 percent they have to refer you to the pediatrician to just get checked out and make sure everything's okay so we ended up in the pediatrician's department at our local hospital which for some reason was lemon heart i don't know why but it was like a sauna in there and we were there for like six or seven hours. They kept running tests and they kept doing these blood tests and all sorts of checks, all different things. Everything, everything came back normal. There's absolutely nothing wrong with her other than she'd lost too much weight. So the nurse who came to deliver the news did not know my history with Layla and the issues I had with breastfeeding last time. But basically she came in and was like, you need to start, we need, you need to start supplementing with formula to get her weight up. And I pretty much just burst into tears because in fairness, the news was delivered very bluntly, very to the point without any sort of explanation beforehand and no kind of lead up to it. It was just boom, this is what you have to do now. And it was the juxtaposition, and I have no issues obviously feeding a child formula, I did that with Layla, it's absolutely fine. I, you know, whatever way I can feed my child so she's healthy is all that matters to me. Um, but it was the juxtaposition of me having felt that breastfeeding had been going well, only to then find out that it's not, and then be told that you have to do something else as well that you weren't expecting. Um, they ended up sending us back to the hospital where she was born. So. The hospital where she was born is a bit further away than our local hospital and um, we were sent back there to the pediatrics department the pediatrics ward there and we stayed overnight to get help with essentially getting onto a feeding plan feeding schedule um, so what they wanted me to do was essentially feed her pump feed her the expressed milk and then top up with formula if needed to get to they had a set amount of top up they wanted her to have after every breastfeed to make sure that she was getting enough calories to gain weight um and so we were like okay so that's what we did we went to the hospital we we were like trying to feed her on the schedule and do all the pumping stuff and everything the problem was she was such a sleepy baby in those first couple of weeks that it was literally impossible to wake her up to feed her if she wanted to sleep she was sleeping like i could not wake her up to feed her for love nor money um and so they had us on this three hourly schedule but it was taking me like two hours just to feed her and then i was like how is she supposed to be hungry again in an hour from now sort of thing so that was a real struggle we got there in the end um about a week and a half later she was back up just past her birth weight um and at that point we were told we didn't have to stick to a schedule anymore we could just do feed on demand but unfortunately with the way things have gone we've never we've not been able to go back to exclusively breastfeeding so we're still combination feeding and that's fine i've come to the realization that um i don't think we're going to get back to ex exclusively breastfeeding so in this whole time whilst we were on this feeding plan and ever and since i've been speaking to midwives uh lactation consultants turned out she also had a tongue tie which we got resolved and i've been seeing lactation consultants even took her to see the osteopath um literally done everything and we've been trying to move back towards exclusively breastfeeding the problem is like we've done everything that we can i've done everything that i can i know i'm doing everything right because peter was telling me that i'm doing everything right in terms of getting her on me getting her latched my supply is there because i'm pumping enough to feed her from a bottle but she's just not able to get the milk out she's just unable to transfer the milk from me to her 
so um not efficiently anyway so unfortunately we're still having to combi feed and it seems like we're going to be moving more and more towards her being bottle fed over breastfed which is quite sad it's not what i wanted but ultimately i'm still able to pump so while i can still pump milk for her i will i will do that for as long as i have a supply and then we will just try we'll just transition to formula after that so um it is what it is but she's gaining weight beautifully so that's all that matters Like I said, we've done everything we can to help her, but she's just not, she's not able to. Hey, okay. So it's too much hard work, isn't it? All right, so she's still sleeping, which is nice. And I'm gonna try and turn her around to show her to you a little bit better. Ooh, okay. Oh. Hello. Nope, still sleepy. Yeah, so she's five weeks old tomorrow. I did plan on doing this video a little bit sooner, but just didn't work out that way. <laughs> she's still pretty dinky. I think she's probably she's probably now around the weight that Layla was when she was born. I uh, haven't had her weighed recently, but we had her weighed uh, right around just before she turned one month old, and she was. She'd just broken the three kilo mark on the scales and Layla was about three and a half kilos at birth. So, oh, big yawns. Okay, I should probably go back to sleep. Um, I'm so sweaty up here. Anyway, thank you for joining me today. Like I said, everything is going great. Little Nova's doing great. She sleeps pretty good at night, in fairness. Um, she sleeps pretty well. She wakes up two to three times in the night to feed, depending on when she fell asleep so she's doing well which is good she's growing nicely she still looks tiny in clothes that are meant to be up to one month old size and you know she's five weeks old tomorrow and she's still pretty small in them but it just means she gets a lot more wear out of her clothes which is going to be nice and um yeah so that's it for now thank you so much for joining us today and um i will be back soon oh so the other video idea i had that i thought might be interesting because my my two birth experiences were very different um with layla and with nova um which i know everyone's birth experiences with more than one child each child's birth experience is very different however what's really different about mine is one was layla was born in new york and nova was born here in the uk so i thought it might be interesting to do a video where i compare the experience I had in the US versus the experience I had in the UK with things like prenatal care, postnatal care, the actual birth, the hospital experience, what things are different uh, between the systems and obviously that would be very much specific to my experience and very much specific to my experience in New York versus my experience here in Kent. So um, they're not going to be, it's not going to be exactly the same across the UK or across the US but I thought it might be interesting because I was, I remember searching on YouTube before I had Nova to see if there was anyone else who posted about like differences between giving birth in the US versus the UK. And I couldn't find anything. I think I found one video, but even then it wasn't what I was looking, it was an American giving birth in the UK and she was talking about her experiences, but she hadn't given birth in the US. So there, it wasn't that direct comparison. So I don't know. I thought that might be an interesting video. Um, to see what you guys if you were interested in something like that i also asked uh perry my husband if he would be willing to give me his opinions on the differences and what he thought about it um so i could share that with you as well so i thought it might be interesting to hear from his perspective as well what he thought was different and how he felt about the differences because um when we were in the us he dealt a lot he dealt with all the insurance stuff with the birth and just in general with our medical insurance it was all like that was his thing that he was dealing with so um i thought it would be interesting to hear about that as well um but yeah anyway so let me know if you'd be interested in hearing that sort of comparison i definitely felt there was a real distinct difference between 
giving birth here versus the US. And I wouldn't say one was necessarily better than the other. I think some things were better about one and some were better about the other. Um, you know, as with anything, some systems are better than others. Um, or some things, uh, it's hard to explain. No one does anything perfectly. So while some things are better here, other things were better in the US. So I just thought it'd be, might be an interesting thing to have a little chat about. Anyway, let me know what you think about that and I will see you guys again very soon. Take care and bye-bye. Typical, the moment, the moment I stop recording, this one wakes up. So now that she's awake. Can you say hello? Oh, big yawns. Big yawn. Yeah. <laughs> hey. What do you think? Just chilling. Oh, the other thing I forgot to mention, she is like a carbon copy of her big sister as a baby. Layla looked exactly the same as a, as a newborn. I was like, did I just give birth to the same child? Um, <laughs> but she's starting to look a little bit different now, now that she's getting a bit older. Um, her face is changing a little bit. And that's all the same thing that happened with Layla. Around one month, her face started to change. Oh, just adjust myself. Um, and yeah but her face is starting to change a little bit but she still looks a lot like Layla did as well which is really sweet they have the they had the exact same hairline as babies same full head of hair and uh and yeah I better go and deal with this little grumpus and I will speak to you guys again soon bye